Um, yeah, just a, uh, a functional header for this one is fine. I'm grading it mostly for your annotations and your citations, and then just making sure everything's formatted correctly, making sure you have pretty good sources. Anything else I'm not super concerned about. I anticipate most of you will do quite well in this assignment if you've been looking for sources and finding really good ones and uh, giving good annotations. The only way I can see you doing really poorly on this is if you just didn't do what you're supposed to do or you didn't find uh, the sources that I asked you to find. For the most part though, I anticipate most will do pretty well on this. My goal is to have all these graded by Monday. It shouldn't take me that long to grade them. I want to give myself a little bit of time just in case. And at that point, I'll have an idea of who maybe needs to find some different sources or who's on the right track. I had a librarian reach out to me yesterday because apparently all the librarians are still working. They're all still doing uh, not work on campus, but working from their homes doing work for the campus. And the university assigned a different librarian to each disc section, which is really great. So ours emailed me yesterday asking how she could help. And I said, I don't really know right now. We're still seeing what uh, problems we might encounter for the research paper. But I would like to maybe have her come in maybe next week or the following week and do just a either a tutorial on how to incorporate sources really well or how to uh, really analyze sources, or if you're having trouble finding other sources, see if she can show you how to use some of the more advanced databases that the library uses. But she's really great. I talked to her yesterday. She is originally a, a music and theater librarian, but she, like all librarians at the university, just has an extensive background and everything. And she's incredibly smart. I can't, her name is Pam something, I can't quite remember her last name, but I will send all of you her email address. That way, if you do have any questions, you could send her an email and say, hey, I'm looking for a kind of source like this for this class. I gave her my prompt for this research assignment and she's got the syllabus, so she knows what we're doing and when as well. So she has an idea of what you all are, uh, not specifically researching, but she knows some of you are looking at politics, some of you are looking at food, some of you are looking at alcohol, that kind of stuff. So after this weekend, once I see how you all did on the annotated bibliography, I'll probably work on bringing her in for a short little seminar or something. Just to sure. clarify, yeah. I know um, this last class you said we didn't have to do notes for the, we only had to do the annotations? Correct. Okay, just, all right, just for Yeah, I, I, um, Notes are really helpful. I still encourage you to take notes because notes can help you write your annotation and notes can help you keep track of uh, the different quotes that you might want to use for support and evidence in your paper. But for this one, because we've all just kind of been thrown for a loop with the scheduling, I wanted you to focus more on the finished product. And then you can always go back and use those sources again. You all have the links to your sources and everything. You can always go back, follow those links and find your uh, quotes that you need and everything like that. Any other questions or concerns? Yeah, no problem at all. I'm trying to think of anything else I might be forgetting. Da, 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 da. Oh, I know. Uh, so all of you posted, or I think the majority of you posted your uh, updated thesis statements to Canvas yesterday. A lot of what I saw, uh, based on what I looked at, everyone's improved in some way. I'll write more detailed comments after class today. But you're all on the right track. Some of you have really great, amazing thesis statements that I don't really have any uh, further suggestions for. Some of you have gotten better, but it could still maybe go a step or two more to refine it and really make it something really good. So you are all leaving good comments on each other's thesis statements. I appreciate that. I'm just gonna go through once and just kind of offer up my own suggestions for those who need it. But you all have really great ideas and you all have really good, largely focused research topics, which is really good to see. Uh, so no one's like off in the wilderness that I have to go like go and find you and bring you back. So that's really good to see. Um, today what we're going to talk about is introductions and conclusions because if I, yes, I did do that. Um, so for Monday, you're submitting your first two paragraphs for your research paper on Canvas. So that would include your introduction and then, uh, probably some kind of like background paragraph or literature review paragraph. So what I want to talk about today is introductions and how to write a good introduction. Because a lot of you are probably used to writing introductions where it's very kind of basic. You just kind of introduce the problem, give your thesis statement, then move on. A good introduction always captures your reader's interest. And even if you're writing about the same topic as someone else, I shouldn't be able to take the introductions of both paragraphs and be able to swap them for one another and the, and the essay still makes sense. Your introduction should be unique to 
you and your research paper. Oh, this dog. Um, so I want to kind of look at different kinds of introductions today. Some of you are, are uh, have a good eye for this kind of stuff. Others could use a little bit of help. That's totally fair. Uh, introductions can be really hard to write, especially if they're the first thing you write. But I want to kind of get you in the habit of writing it now, and we'll have plenty of chances to revise next week as well. So what I want to show you today is I'm going to share my screen. Come on, buddy. All right, so that is our schedule. So I picked three different sources. Uh, one is an article from the Atlantic, one is an opinion piece in the Washington Post, and then one is a uh, peer-reviewed scholarly journal article. And it's kind of want to look at how each one of them does their introductions. So let's start with the uh, opinion article for the Washington Post. Now, what is, what's the point of an opinion article in a newspaper, like the Washington Post or Wall Street Journal or anything like that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Yeah, uh, what's the purpose of, a, of an opinion article in a major newspaper? Or an editorial, sometimes that they're also known. Well, especially if it's politics, you have to gauge both sides. Yeah, so it's about uh, providing opinions or providing different sides of an argument and trying to provide both sides. So you'll usually have uh, some newspapers, I remember my back uh, in New Orleans back in the day, they would have one issue and they'd have uh, a Republican right a response and a Democrat right a response side by side so we could read them both. Uh, other newspapers aren't quite as explicit in saying like, oh, this person's a liberal or this person's a conservative, but they do try to present uh, opposing sides to a reasonable degree. So yeah, it's about arguing some kind of issue in a public forum. So this one that I found here, uh, I thought was really interesting and caught my eye. Get rid of political conventions, not just this year, but forever. And basically, as you can probably tell from the title, the thesis statement is, let's get rid of political conventions, not just Democrat or Republicans, but all of them forever. And they're going to explain why in the first few sentences. So here's the introduction here. The Democratic National Committee, we learned Thursday, has wisely decided against holding its convention as scheduled in July in Milwaukee. Bowing to the coronavirus threat, it has pushed the date back to August 17th, which is a week before the Republicans get together in Charlotte to nominate President Trump to a second term. So both these conventions will be happening more or less around the same time. But here's another idea. Get rid of the conventions entirely, not just this year, but forever. They are gaudy week-long infomercials funded by lobbyists, offering but a few moments that can hold a decent sized television audience. Taxpayers of the cities that host them are, off, are usually left holding a big bill. Now an introduction for a, an opinion article like this, it's meant to be read for a wide variety of people is different from an introduction that you'll write for your paper. But what about this introduction here, just these first two paragraphs catches your eyes? Or that you like about it or that you don't like about it that you think isn't very interesting at all? Maybe another way of asking it too is, how does this writer get the reader's interest? Anyone? I guess I noticed diction first. Okay, in what oh. way? And I'm getting uh, like, oh, go ahead if you want. Oh no 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 no! I I finished saying what I wanted to say. Oh okay. Um, there's well, I see the words like gaudy and um where he's he calls it like a week-long infomercial which i found like kind of funny mm -hmm. and um where he uses like bowing to the coronavirus threat you can see a lot of his um personality kind of shine through the writing which sort of grasps my attention yeah it's definitely very expressive it uses words that aren't the typical words you might normally use but they still make sense and they still work and it's very active language too like you mentioned bowing to the coronavirus threat that's a very like active image that we see that kind of literalizes what the Democratic Committee is doing for this uh, convention. And I like they point out gaudy too in week-long infomercials. And if we follow that train too, uh, funded by lobbyists, offering but a few moments that can hold a decent sized television audience. What about this sentence, uh, especially like these three things, gaudy, week-long infomercials, funded by lobbyists. What kind of response are you meant to have to these phrases? Do you want to watch an infomercial ever? 
Probably not. No. Probably not. I would imagine not. Uh, do we like lobbyists? Do we not like lobbyists? Probably not. It depends on who you are, but absolutely. Like a lot of it lobbyists depends. is kind of like a, I'm sorry, go ahead on. I said it just depends, honestly. Yeah, it does. It depends, Maybe. but almost always lobbyists can be kind of like a pejorative term being like, oh, I'm sick of lobbyists lobbying for um, the NRA or for Planned Parenthood or forever. It seems like each side has their issue with lobbyists for the other side in some way. So nobody likes lobbyists. They get paid to just kind of wine and dine and schmooze politicians. So what they're doing here, this writer is doing here, is they're framing the convention in such a way that's all it, things that people hate. No one wants to watch infomercials. Nobody likes lobbyists. Gaudy is kind of uh, tacky, over the top to a really like uh, tacky degree. So yeah, so he's really working hard, uh, or she, I think it is a she. Yeah, Karen. Uh, she's working hard to make it appeal, seem as though these conventions are not a good idea. Other things that stand out to people, Auden, I'm, I didn't hear what you said earlier uh, before uh, Bella started talking. Did you say something else about the, the introduction here? Um, I mean, not really. Oh, wait, am I muted? No, I'm not. Um, not really. I just was saying he makes kind of an emphatic statement by getting rid of the conventions just because I feel like it's just something that's been going on for so long that I, I don't know, honestly, but I just think a lot of people wouldn't think to just get rid of the conventions entirely. Yeah, it's one of those things where the way they present their problem is, it's like, oh, uh, we had to cancel it because of the coronavirus, but I'm going to go a step further and say we need to cancel them forever. And the problem is that they are long, they're funded by lobbyists, which means they're probably not funded by actual uh, citizens or members of the parties. And then nobody cares about them. No one actually watches them on TV. And then the taxpayers of the cities that host them are usually left holding a big bill. Those are pretty significant problems, especially this last one right here. Um, I'm trying to think. I know uh, in 2016, there was a lot of issues with cities not getting paid for rallies that are being held or conventions that are being held. So it's an issue when you're suddenly left up the creek for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So they're presenting the problem in a way that's, hey, like, now that we see that this stuff isn't really important, let's look at how it's actually really bad for us anyway and try to get rid of it. So they're framing their problem in a very kind of uh, specific, interesting way, but they're still showing the problem and their solution is obviously get rid of the conventions. If they're doing all these bad things, we don't need them or we can come up with some kind of alternative later. So that's that. Again, very short, very different from the kind of introduction you'll be writing. But what I do want to point out is the way that they kind of set up this issue of, hey, Here's a solution we found to this problem, but it doesn't go quite far enough because it still doesn't address these issues here. So now I wanna look at a slightly more sophisticated article. This is from The Atlantic. I think some of you are pulling from Pip. My dog. Um, I think some of you are pulling articles from The Atlantic. And I wanna look at this one here because these tend to be also kind of opinion articles. They're also very critical, analytical, but they do tend to be better written. They tend to be written for a more educated audience. So this one kind of stood out to me here. The real reason of the, le the real lesson of the college closures, and of course the subline is, outside the Ivy League, students who go home for the semester are at risk of leaving school for good. So just kind of reading the first couple paragraphs for this introduction. When some college students first got the news that their school was canceling in-person classes due to the coronavirus outbreak, they broke out into spontaneous dan dining hall dance parties, joked about nabbing dirt cheap flights to Italy, and plotted elaborate pranks to dupe their professors over video chat. But for plenty of low-income students, the deluge of colleges that have shut their doors because of COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus, hasn't led to revelry. It's been really chaotic, Andrew Perez, a Harvard senior from Los Angeles, told me. Being a first-generation student, it feels like a gut punch not having my parents see me walk across the stage. Da -da -da. It talks about skip, uh, sending him stone here. It's quite possibly the, mo the single most disruptive event in American higher education in at least half a century one that has left students scrambling to wrangle flights home and pack up their dorm room. When students at the University of Dayton were given just 24 hours to flee campus, they rioted, throwing bottles at police officers and jumping on top of cars. Even at Harvard, the richest university in the world, some students were left to crowdfund alternative housing and moving arrangements. So starting off, what's the problem that the writer is addressing here?
students not taking the virus seriously. Okay, students not taking the virus seriously, but uh, even bigger than that, like what's, because uh, the writer seems to be kind of taking the side of the students in some cases. What's the bigger problem in some cases than students not taking it seriously? So they're closing campuses, they're shifting all classes online. Some colleges took it a step further, sending all their students home for the year. And then down here, students at the University of Dayton were given just 24 hours to flee campus. They rioted, throwing bottles at police officers and jumping on top of cars. Even at Harvard, the richest university in the world, some students were left to crowdfund alternative housing and moving arrangements. Why would the students at Dayton be rioting against, po against police? Given 24 hours to leave campus. Seems a little unnecessary. The rioting? Yeah. Probably so. I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't recommend throwing bottles at police officers or jumping on top of cars, but why do you think they did that? Why do you think they- Because they, they only way? had 24 hours to like pack up their whole lives and leave. Yeah, exactly. If you've already planned to be here for still another two, three months or so, and you've got to pack up your entire dorm room, probably without help, depending on where your parents are, depending on where your family is, you may not have the option to have people come and help you, that's a huge stress. And then of course you have to find a way to get all that stuff back to your home, which again, might be out of state, might be a uh, thousand miles away. In some cases for students at SMU out of the country. And what about uh, Harvard? Some students were left to crowdfund alternative housing and moving arrangements. What does that mean? Crowdfunding for those of you who don't know, who don't know is like a GoFundMe kind of, uh, raising funds to GoFundMe. A lot of students like don't have the money to just find, like fly home immediately or find like other housing. Yeah, absolutely. For a lot of students, and I mentioned uh, Andrew Perez, he's a Harvard senior. He's a first generation student. That means he's the first person in his family to go to college. Uh, he may not have the money to buy the planes to get to get back home or to find housing in the Boston area to make sure that if Harvard does reopen, depending on what time it reopens, that he can go back to classes when they start back up. And it's not just him, obviously this happens across the country to different universities. But the main problem to me seems to be that, uh, yeah, some students aren't taking it seriously, but in a lot of ways, students, the universities are taking it too seriously and, and not taking the students' well-being into consideration is what the writer seems to be introducing the problem as to me. So obviously, I don't think she supports students rioting, throwing bottles at police officers. But at the same time, she clearly thinks it's wrong for universities to just kind of be kicking out their students and sending them on their way. How does she capture our interest, though, with these opening paragraphs? How does she work up to present the problem? Just look at the first paragraph, even. How does that kind of catch your interest? It's pretty like lighthearted. Like it's not as near, like you kind of go from kind of this, uh, like they're saying like joking about nabbing dirt cheap flights and then go to rioting like a paragraph later. Couple yeah, paragraph. Absolutely, it's kind of funny. Like this idea like dining hall dance parties. I don't know if that happened at SMU or not, but if it did, I would think that's funny. Uh, nabbing dirt cheap flights to Italy. My friends and I joked about it like, oh, like, flights to Spain are super cheap right now. Why don't we just like get out of here and go there? And elaborate pranks, I don't know what that entailed. But uh, yeah, like this is all pretty lighthearted because I think at first, a lot of us didn't take it all that seriously. And we all kind of were like, oh, like this isn't gonna be a big deal. We're not affected by this. But you're right, this is a huge uh, contrast to the rioting that she talks about later on. So what do we call that? When she presents one kind of image, but then brings in another one that kind of directly opposes that one. How might you describe that? I think she's giving like background information, but then talking about like what her actual point is for yeah. writing. Yeah, definitely giving background information, explaining why these things have happened the way they have. Like, hey, schools were canceled, so we needed, so students reacted this way, students reacted this way. Kind of giving some background information there. In fact, we all know now COVID-19 is the disease that was caused by coronavirus but she even includes that just in case we didn't already know what that is. So yeah, providing a little background information. What else? 
Because in, in the first paragraph, in this first paragraph, she seems to be saying, hey, like, look at how funny this is. Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? And then later on, she says, actually, no, it's not. People are getting kicked out of their dorms and they have nowhere else to go and nowhere else to live. So it's almost as though she's saying like, hey, you think this situation is this way, but in actuality, it's this way. That's a really valid way of presenting a, a problem and a solution, or at least a problem, in your introduction. If you say, hey, everyone thinks that alcohol advertisements have come such a long way in the Me Too era, and they've done such a better job at respecting women, but actually they're still doing these bad things here. Or, hey, political cartoons are funny and great, and they're good for a laugh, and we can share them really fast on social media through memes and stuff, but really what they do is really bad, and they do blah, blah, blah. So it can be really effective sometimes to present what you think the common view is and then kind of jump in and say, well, actually, uh, this isn't as all fun and lighthearted as it looks, or this isn't actually the way it appears to be. So we have two kind of differing approaches here, where here she introduces the problem being, uh, oh, well, we can't have this convention because of coronavirus, therefore we'll just push it back, and then turns that solution into an even bigger solution, saying, hey, Let's take this a step further and do this. And here her, te her technique is almost like uh, compare and contrast, showing what you think, how you think the world is, and then saying, actually, no, it's more like this, and it's actually really bad. And Fresi go on to read the article too. She gets more into it. Elite colleges are best positioned to ride at the tumult of a closure because of the most simple economic equation around. Uh, they are stocked with the progeny of the uber-rich, blah, blah, blah. Um, at community colleges, those rates were even higher. These are rates of students who, um, they found that nearly half students suffer from housing instability, while nearly 40% had gone hungry in the past month. At community colleges, those rates are even higher. Harvard's largely wealthy student body may be prepared to deal with the financial and academic fallout of a pandemic-triggered school shutdown, but many students elsewhere aren't at all. So here, she elaborates further on the problem that she presented in her introduction, saying, hey, um, for students who go to Harvard, maybe they have the money, maybe they don't need to worry about what they're going to eat next or where they're going to live, but for other students, excuse me one moment. Sorry about that. My dogs are having too much fun. So what she's saying here is, if you go to Harvard, even if you're well off, yeah, fine, you might be okay. But for a lot of students who don't go to Harvard, which is the majority of the nation, or a lot of students who don't go to Ivy League schools, they might have much more dire situations. They might be in a lot more dire situations. So last but not least, I want to look at the introduction to a peer-reviewed journal article here. So. This is probably a little bit closer to what you'll be writing. You'll be writing something in between this one, like for the Atlantic article, and this one here for the Scholarly Journal. It's not going to be as long as this kernel article is, but your introduction is still going to be uh, very captivating, presenting some kind of problem, maybe presenting some kind of solution as well, depending on what it is you're writing about, and trying to capture your reader's attention in a way that's not just eye catching, but also is treating your audience like an intelligent, learned audience. So this article that I chose, it's called The Folklore of Deinstitutionalization, Popular Film and the Death of the Asylum, 1973 to 1979. This is from the Journal of American Studies. They study a lot of, well, American pop culture things. And basically what this article is about is the writer analyzes four different movies, The Exorcist, One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, Halloween, and When a Stranger Calls, and analyzes them in terms of what was happening in America during that time. So I'll skip a little bit, get down to just the opening paragraph. When the producers of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest secured the Oregon State Hospital for their use in the winter of 1974-75, they were thrilled. Director Milos Foreman wanted realism and the OSH had it to spare. Cold white rooms, gray light pouring in through tall grated windows and pale worn floors betokened a veracity rarely seen in the screen asylum. The fact that Foreman had a whole wing of the institution to himself, to the film, to fill in, also reflected the state of patient care. The OSA census had declined from a mid-century high of over 8,000 residents to somewhere between 200 and 300 persons. 
New drugs and new laws, compounded by a sustained critique of inpatient regimes, had drastically reduced census numbers. By the 1970s, mental hospitals faced a crisis of existential proportions. Foreman's groundbreaking film about rebellion against institutions found its moment. So basically what he's saying here is like, hey, this movie that everybody kind of knows and loves, One for the Cuckoo's Nest, they filmed in an actual mental hospital, but the only way they were able to do that is because a lot of people were being uh, removed from mental institutions, either because of new laws or because of new drugs. This was the time period where a lot of people were saying, hey, instead of locking people with mental illnesses away, maybe we should try treating them. So that's why a lot of hospitals started kind of getting rid of some of their patients. Um, but that wasn't always a good thing. And basically what he goes into for the next couple paragraphs is talking about how in the 70s, uh, people who received psychological care were usually just kind of like given a pill, kicked out, and then moved on to the next thing, which led to a lot of mentally ill people becoming homeless or uh, dying on the streets because they could no longer be held in the institutions for an extended period of time. So that's what he's talking about here. He's comparing kind of like one for the cuckoo's nest to institutions and to uh, some kind of efforts to push back against those institutions. And this is like the end of his introduction. It's a long introduction because it's a 25 page essay. This is the end of his introduction here. In this essay, I show how Foreman's film and three others told audiences a resonant message in an uncertain time. The Exorcist, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Halloween, and When a Stranger Calls will be examined not just as artifacts of entertainment, but as a kind of folklore. Specifically, I argue that these movies articulated long-standing American fears of tyranny, control, and gender disorder using a vernacular mythic framework. Further, all four films utilize elements of the horror genre which reinforces this folkloric landscape. So basically what he's saying is, hey, this was a time period when a lot of people were pushing back against the tyranny and control of the institution. And these horror movies, to a certain extent, also engage in that kind of rhetoric and that kind of uh, emotion as well. So going back to that first paragraph here for this one, Again, it's a little bit drier. It's definitely meant for a more learned audience than some of the other articles we've looked at already. But how does he, how does Troy Rondon get his reader's attention? Or how does he open his essay? Is One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest a, a popular film? I've never heard of it. What? I read the book, but I don't think I've ever seen the film. Oh, the book's great. The film's also really great. The um, book is wonderful. Chance are, the book is great. If you, you all get a chance to read One for the Cuckoo's Nest, read it. It's all about uh, people in a mental institution and drugs and craziness, and it's deeply funny and also deeply disturbing. It's really great. Um, and the movie is Jack Nicholson. It's also really deeply funny and deeply disturbing. But anyway, chances are that even if you don't know the movie or haven't heard of it before, shit start your parents know it or your grandparents know it pretty well. But this was a huge movie in the 70s. It won, I'm pretty sure it won an Oscar for Jack Nicholson and an Oscar for Best Picture. And this was kind of like the defining movie of the 70s in terms of it was very like anti-establishment. It's all about these people in a mental hospital pushing against authority and fighting against the really kind of authoritative nurse that forces them to... Uh, sit around and do different kinds of demeaning therapy, stuff like that. So for a lot of readers, especially reading this uh, article, who would probably be other professors or other scholars of American history and culture, would already probably be familiar with this movie. And he kind of goes into the background behind it, kind of like a behind the scenes thing saying, hey, uh, One Food Cougar's Nest was filmed at a real institution, which I didn't know personally, um, and goes into why they were able to do that. The only reason they were able to film an entire wing of the institution was because whereas it used to have over a thousand residents, now it only had 200. So they had a whole wing of the hospital that they could have to themselves because new laws were pushing people out the door as quickly as possible. So basically what he does, and I'll kind of explain this just because we're a little short on time, but the way he's doing this is he's presenting this interesting fact like, oh, hey, they filmed this movie because uh, these laws made it made them able to do these things but then kind of goes more into the actual problem behind this like oh even though we started having people leave these mental health facilities 
what happened was uh, the end result of these innovations which correlated with and were reinforced by an unwinding of the government's commitment to welfare state social solutions was that, formerly uh, was that people formerly treated via extended care increasingly found themselves relegated to cramped and decrepit single residency apartments or even suffering exposure on the streets. The demise of the state hospitals significantly would be met not with protest but with praise. Mental institutions, commonly called asylums, were depicted as houses of horror. What he's saying is like, yeah, it's good that we no longer had people sitting around in institutions, but then they were just forced into these small apartments that they couldn't really afford because they couldn't get jobs, and that wasn't a whole lot better than what they were in before. So he's saying like, hey, here's how people think the issue is, here's how it actually is, and here's how these four movies that I'm gonna be studying look at this issue or uh, incorporate this issue into their scripts, into their imagery, into their uh, performances, anything like that. And it goes on to examine those movies. Has anyone else heard of the, the Exorcist or Halloween or When a Stranger Calls? Yes. I think they remade When a Stranger Calls like maybe like 10 or 15 years ago. But everyone knows Halloween, I think. They just had a new one out last year. Most people know the actress. So yeah, so all big name movies that he's like, hey, like, I'm gonna show you a new way of looking at these movies in light of this historical thing that was happening at the time. All these ways of introducing an argument that we presented are totally valid ways for you to open your argument or open your paper. If you wanna open with a quote from someone that you found while you were doing some research, if you wanna open with a personal anecdote or an anecdote from someone else, feel free to do that. The point is you want to get your reader's attention and draw them in with not just something interesting, but something that they can relate to as well. The readers for this article, the writer's assuming knows the movies he's talking about. And chances are if they're reading this article, they probably do know the movies. Here, this person in the Washington Post is assuming you don't really know anything about this issue and is just kind of giving you some background information and explaining why these conventions are bad using language you can understand. We all don't like infomercials. We all don't like lobbyists. Same thing here, kind of giving some background history and relating to readers on a, uh, on a kind of plane that they can understand, that they can relate to the writer on. Everyone knows that college is kind of crazy and we have fun times and everything, but then we need to think more about how students are really being affected on top of all the fun and spontaneity and that kind of stuff. That's what I'd like for you to try to do with your introductions for Monday, is try to make them interesting, try to really engage your reader. I wouldn't have your intro to, intros be more than a page long or so, but just try your best. Go for it, just shoot it out, and then for your second paragraph, try to give some kind of background information or uh, a, a review of the literature up to that point, of the research studies up to that point. But the point is, we're gonna be revising these quite a bit next week. In fact, uh, we'll only have Monday, Wednesday next week. So you'll submit these introductions on Monday and we'll all look them together. And we'll probably just do a discussion board thing, talk on Zoom for like 10 minutes and then hop on Canvas and I'll respond to each other's introductions because I want you to see what each other is doing and how you can either improve your introduction, how you can be more compelling, or that what you're doing is great and you're doing really well and you can kind of keep moving forward with, with your paper. One last thing I wanna talk about is I, Wanted to show you two papers that I had last semester. These were the final papers that they wrote. And close this for now. And what they did was they were both writing about their experiences in faith-based faith -based organizations on campus. One was Methodist, I can't quite remember what the other one was. And even though they were writing about the same topic, their introductions were very different and they presented the issue in a different way. And you couldn't take the introduction of one with the introduction of the other and swip and swatch them, swap them, I'm losing my mind, swap them and have the essays still make sense. So I want to take a look at those two intros real fast. I removed the names so that way you can't tell who they are. One paragraph has some highlighting on it. Ignore that. Um, it's just for leftover from my notes when I was grading it last semester. So uh, I'm not going to read through both these, but I just want to show you. Here, this person is talking about um, Christian community on Southern Methodist, or I'll, I'll, I'll read the first couple sentences. Christians often leave no room for dialogue with outside groups that hold different values. This, at least, is a dominant stereotype that the world has about the Christian community. On Southern Methodist University campus in particular, the Wesley House, a Methodist college ministry, 
invites all Christians and non-Christians to gather together and build relationships as one community. Many students on campus often believe that they are not welcome at the Wesley House because of its title as a Methodist ministry. However, the Wesley House, and then she goes on. So she's presenting this uh, problem as like, hey, like many people think this, but in actuality, the, the reality is this. People think that Christians can be closed-minded or kind of clicky, but really we want to open ourselves up to more people. And maybe Wesley House could do better at this by advertising more events, uh, improving the campus community as a whole. So kind of like that juxtaposition of people might think this, but actually it's more like this. Compare that to this introduction here. At the beginning of every week of Reformed University Fellowship, James Madden, the organization's campus director and leader, claims that RUF at SMU is about real people, deep truth, and rich fellowship. And most importantly, it's for everyone. And this was a direct quote from James Madden himself. RUF is one of the many interdenominational campus ministries where all students are invited to worship and be part of something bigger than themselves. One of the core values that Madden emphasizes in his opening statements is that while maintaining the core goal of achieving close connection with faith, every student on campus is welcome to be involved as little or as much as they feel comfortable with. Therefore, since all these aspects of RUF sound fantastic and completely awesome, a perfectly reasonable question that could be asked might be, why wouldn't every student want join an organization like this? The most common response is that there's a noticeable misconception on campus that joining organizations like RUF require large, large time commitments and heavy involvement. On-campus ministries must advertise the benefits of the choice of involvement level for each organization to students in order to increase participation and improve campus community. So these two introductions for these essays, and both these essays got an A, by the way, these two introductions are addressing the same issue of how their respective faith-based community can better mark themselves to the university as a whole. But you couldn't take this one here about the Wesley House and this one here about RUF and swap these two introductions and have the rest of the paper make sense. They've made their introductions very unique to their topic and unique to their own experiences too. Clearly this person brought in some of their experience with Wesley House and this person even went to James Madden himself and interviewed him and brought in a direct quote from him to talk about like what RUF is. That's the kind of creativity that I'm looking for. A lot of you might be writing about politics. A lot of you might be writing about alcohol. I know there's a couple people, couple people write about immigration and that's great. You should be writing about similar things because I want you to be able to help each other. But if your introductions could be switched and I wouldn't be able to tell the difference, that's not a good thing. I want to see your own personality and your own way of presenting the problem to your readers. Make it unique, make it creative. Better to take a risk and have it not quite work out than to play it safe and be really boring, is my philosophy personally. Any questions about either these two introductions or writing introductions in general? Like I said, oh, okay. yeah. what was what was the uh, the chapter in style about the opening paragraphs? Do you remember? Lesson that? seven. Yeah, was it lesson seven? Um, it might have been lesson seven, or it might have been. Do I have my style with me? I should give me one second. I'm sorry. You think that I would keep track of my stuff better at this point? I found it now. It's underneath your essays. Okay, so introductory paragraph in style. Check the index. Uh, so I put, I, it was a mistake on the syllabus. Is that seven, lesson seven motivation? Is lesson seven global coherence? Um, I believe pages 71 through 74 talk about the introduction specifically and talk about how to format your introduction in a way that's coherent, in a way that's interesting. 
Let me see if there are other sections as well that I might want to look at. Yeah, if you look at, if you look at the index for your style book on page 154, it's got introduction and it has all different kinds of subsettings, like how do you write a conclusion for the introduction, which is your thesis statement usually. How do you plan your introduction on page 70, uh, 65? Uh, you can use that to kind of look more closely at what it is you can do with your introduction to make it more effective. But definitely the most important part for making it coherent, to make it kind of all gel together well, you're going to look at lesson seven, pages 71 through 74. Is it yeah, 71 through 74. Thank you, Fraud, for pointing that out to me. I couldn't quite uh, recall which pages that were on. So yeah, other questions about introductions or writing them? Many of you are quite good at this already. Um, those of you who I had last semester, I, I think you're, you're pretty good. You just need to remind yourself about how to write good introductions. Um, but you all clearly enjoy your research topics. So it doesn't seem like it's gonna be an issue of like, oh, I don't care what I'm writing about, so I don't know what to write about. Um, I'll give you feedback on your thesis statements as soon as we're done here. And then uh, you can probably move forward with working on your introduction and your introductory paragraphs for that. Other questions? I apologize if that was kind of rushed. I am as tired as you all are, I'm sure. Um, but we're almost to Easter for those of you who celebrate. And for those of you who don't celebrate, you get Friday off next week. Any concerns? Is the class moving too fast or is it a good pace? It's a good pace. Good pace. I'm trying not to rush anything, but at the same time, I'm trying to make sure that we're still on pace, on track to finish everything we need to. Uh, has the university told you about the temporary grading policy? Have they emailed yeah. you about that yet? Yeah. Okay, I just wanna make sure, cool. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that, uh, personally. I think it's a good mix of, it takes the pressure off of me for having to decide like pass fail, cause that can be kind of stressful. Like, you know, how do you judge the, performance of a student who did a really great work and the student who did okay work as being the same. Uh, but I like that you're able to kind of have that option if you're not happy with your grade afterwards. So I'm pretty content with that. Um, and I'll work to have your final grades back to you pretty quickly, but just know you have until like the end of May to make that decision if you need to. Um, I round my grades typically if you're close to a, a borderline, like if, you're, if you have like an 89, uh, chances are I bump it up to a 90 at the end of the semester. Uh, as long as you're within like a point or so of that uh, grade breakdown there. So we can talk more about that when the time comes, but I'm, I'm pretty uh, reasonable when it comes to looking at that kind of stuff personally, uh, depending on how you view it. Any other questions, comments, concerns? All right, well, in case you're free to go, uh, I'll upload this to YouTube later for those of you who want to listen to me ramble on some more for another hour or so. And I will get to your thesis statements after I drink some more coffee. Sound good? Thank you. Right on, thank you.